have come tonight to the most fabulous and celebrated place in the world. Here on the plateau of Gizeh stands forever the mightiest of human achievements. No traveler, emperor, merchant or poet has trodden on these sands and not gasped in awe. Disclose the stage on which the drama of a civilization took place. Those involved have been present since the dawn of history, pitched stubbornly against sand and wind. And the voice of the desert has crossed the centuries. Tomorrow I shall see the east burning with a new flame. I am the faithful warden at the foot of his law. So faithful, so vigilant, so near him that he gave me his face for my own. I am a Pharaoh's companion, and I am he. Through the ages, I received many names from the people who came to me in adoration. O oh, Harmakis, you are my life's safeguard. Horus, protect me, O oh, great God, that I might see you every day. Lord of the heaven, sovereign of eternity. But the name which has remained with me is that given to me by a Greek traveler, the father of history, Herodotus. He called me Sphinx, as if I were from his land, and that name is now mine. Close to the Nile, I watch over the plateau of Gizeh, over all its monuments of modest or fantastic height. They are tombs. Civilizations are like islands on the ocean of barbarism. Over this one, the Sphinx has gazed and watched for 5,000 years. At the foot of such mountains of stone, everything becomes minute and insignificant. Man is an insect. Yet, it was men who built these massive monuments and the names of pharaohs whose tombs they are have crossed the ages. Their glory has defeated time. Pharaoh of 
the fourth dynasty 4,500 years ago. Here is the great pyramid which he built to defend himself against death. 455 feet high. He achieved the building of the highest monument then known to man. The area it covers is vast enough to hold St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome, the cathedrals of Florence and Milan, Westminster Abbey and St. Paul's. Three million blocks of stone, some of them weighing 30 tons, were assembled by Cheops faithful workmen to achieve this fabulous construction. At the center of it, the pharaoh planned his inner chamber, where his mummy was to lie in splendor for eternity. At the foot of this pyramid, in the rock, a temple was built, and there were kept the barges of Cheops, the barges of night. In these large wooden vessels, the dead pharaoh could continue his voyage in darkness towards eternity. But all that remains of him is a small ivory figure showing a noble face, the nose aquiline, the jaw determined, and the hieroglyphs representing the name he gave to his pyramid. Cheops dominates the horizon. The Pyramid of Kethron. It too bears an inscription, Kethron is great. Yet, out of respect for his father Cheops, Kethron built his pyramid on a slightly smaller scale. Each side of the base measuring 710 feet, the angle being 52 degrees, it reaches a height of 445 feet. The brilliant covering of polished limestone on the apex originally extended over all four sides, adding to the magnificence of the pyramid. The face of Catherine has come down to us sculpted in green diorite streaked with white. A rare stone he brought back from an expedition. Here he is close to us, in the guise of the Sphinx, carved in rock near his tomb. complete this immense funeral site of Gizeh and make it one of the wonders of the world. Though smaller, the Pyramid of Mykerinus is perhaps the most impressive for being the culminating point of a vast design. Having built it, the workmen climbed down from its granite planks and laying on their tools, looked up with wonderment. and powerful was Memphis, the capital city in the plain which joined Upper and Lower Egypt. Great and powerful were the pharaohs who on this side of the Nile built for eternity. Its aim accomplished, the fourth dynasty collapsed. pyramids still stand, and the inscription on the one that completed the design claims, Divine is Makerinus.
Here three pharaohs reign, Cheops, Catherine, and Mykerinus. Sarcophagi may be empty, wrappings unwound, yet Cheops, Catherine, and Mykerinus still reign, bearing the double crown of Upper and Lower Egypt. They reign over that court, very round, over these small pyramids where their queens lie, over the tombs of their ministers, over the whole hierarchy, sleeping forever. Chamberlains, high priests, buffoons, architects, courtesans, each in his proper place in these funerary chambers, which are called Mastabas. For this is a royal palace of the dead, with triumphal perspectives, pavilions, corridors, secret rooms, strong walls. It was a city of another world, approachable by the people only as near as the outer temples, where their devotion led them. Coming from the Nile, one ascended by a monumental causeway built on the same colossal scale to the high temples where only the priests lived among the secrets of the mummy. They alone knew for what journey the great Bhaji was being prepared at the foot of the tomb. A journey with the sun. A journey which had lasted 4,500 years. In the maze of this necropolis, let us stand by a tomb like a thousand others, that of the mother of Cheops, and in it, by the litter marked with golden hieroglyphs, which she had prepared for the eternal journey by her son's side. Neither wind, nor sand, nor centuries could ever entirely silence the voice of the dead. Alexander, Caesar, and Napoleon paused at my feet. I saw the ambitious dreams of conquerors whirling like dead leaves. As my motto, I chose an Arab saying, the world fears time, but time fears the pyramid. Of all ancient monuments, it is the pyramids which have always appealed most vividly to man's imagination. Considered from its top downwards, the pyramid is like the sun's rays bursting through a gap in the clouds. It commemorates the greatest victory of all, victory over death. It is the most perfect mansion, the strongest tent, whose great stone sides above roof and wall, and so carefully sealed that the dream entrusted to it can live.
hidden in the secrecy of its tomb, attended by a whole crowd of statues, provided with all that was necessary for the journey, there in the sarcophagus lay the mummy, to be called on by the soul. For alone and without the body, the soul could not go into the night. And from the depths of this tomb still rises the scent of herbs, cedar oil, resin, But a pyramid is also the perfect combination of simplicity and magnitude, and the interplay of its angles makes the best harmony of shape and volume. It is architecture's purest achievement, because it relies on the straight line alone. Never has the straight line been drawn with more mastery, skill, and strength. Homage must be paid to Imhotep learning who at Saqqara conceived and built the archetype of pyramid. Made up of six mastabas, it rose gradually in a broken line of steps. The idea had been born. Calculations had begun. The perfect form was there. Among all the objects laid by a dead man's side in his tomb, the scribe's palette is undoubtedly the most precious. From it were drawn the hieroglyphs representing the figures which made possible the fabulous calculations ordering these mountains of stone. A lotus flower of a thousand. A finger worth tenfold. A tadpole a hundred thousand. And the scribe's two hands joined in prayer. Stone by stone it was built from earth to heaven. Oh, noble Nile, I salute you. 
for your waters flow majestically and fostered this sacred enterprise. One day the desert sands invaded the fields, marshes dried up on the river's bank. And so, to save his life, man invented civilization. He had to contend with floods, he designed dams and culverts. He came to love the earth and want it for his grave. But soon he wished to outlive the earth. And it was farmers, helped once more by their beneficent river, who <coughs> built these monumental houses of the dead. And I, Catherine's faithful companion, saw the progress of dynasties and grave priests and the light steps of noble ladies whose diaphanous veils seem to clothe them, yet not to touch them. Remember the story of the falcon that stole a sandal while the women were bathing? He snatched it in his beak and by chance dropped it near a pharaoh who was giving audience in his garden. So slender was the sandal, so small in size, that the pharaoh wished to see the owner. And he married her. And do you remember how a nobleman at the court of Cheops lured his wife's lover into a deep lake by means of a wax figure? and there had him turned into a crocodile by a magician. Wishing to impress the pharaoh with his magical powers, he willingly revealed what he had done, but carelessly too. For Cheops punished the guilty and the boaster equally. On his orders, the courtier was thrown to the crocodile, which devoured him, and the unfaithful woman was chastised. Do you remember too a young pharaoh, Armand Hetep II? Never had there been an athlete so strong so handsome, so fine. His shoulders were broad, his waist slender, his thighs were of bronze, and he could tame at will the wildest horse. His exploits are engraved on a stone which he laid before you. Then time in Baladin left it behind like an old man. Then was the beginning in Kyoto. Kept by the Lord in Mesopotamia, Armand had a second was far away from his land. Then one, one day, while hunting the lion, a prince stopped to rest in your shed. He fell asleep. You gave him the tree and spoke to him. Ceremonies have begun. Crowds have gathered on the bank of 
the sad remnants of his tomb. coffin made of wood, adorned with gold and precious stones. The ceremony at the Noah temple is over, and ascending the causeway, the funeral procession nears the tomb, escorted by princes, high state officials, and priests. Sarcophagus is ready at the heart of the pyramid in the funerary chamber. And everything has been prepared for the crossing of the lake which leads to the gates of the other world.
last slab of stone is going to be sealed with such cunning that it will never be known which part of the wall was the door. Dynasty succeeded dynasty. But among all the monarchs of ancient Egypt, none is more appealing than this young pharaoh, a poet and a mystic who followed Amenhetep III. Civilization in its splendor had spread southward step by step, making the valley of the Nile like a triumphal way, bordered by the papyri of learning, furrows of prosperity, terraces of peaceful living and deep meditating tombs. The flame of knowledge had passed from Memphis to Thebes. Large pensive eyes, a weak body and girlish softness, such is the strange youth who has been made all powerful. He leaves Thebes in order to found his own city. He rejects the god Armon and his priests to worship a god of his own choosing, Artan, who is in heaven. And he discards the name of Amenhetep IV to adopt another, Akhenaten. Artan, the unique. drawn back, and in centuries to come, people will see and love the graceful figure of Nefertiti. She was by his side in his struggle to establish the new faith. Of this faith, she was like a reflection. Her radiance inspired sculptors. Thus, the image of her beauty came to us in stone. Thirty years old, and he died. 3,300 years ago, he wrote and recited this prayer. Maker and 
and giver of all things, that men live by your grace. Anton, living and life-giving forever and ever. lasted but a season, the time of a bloom called Nefertiti. Yet there is sadness still in the hearts of men. His successor's name was to have been Tutankhamen. He chose to be known as Tutankhamen after the old god of tradition. Frail and tender, Tutankhamen died not yet twenty after a reign of six years. But 3,000 years have not yet withered his fine, youthful face, nor tarnished the treasures gathered round him in his unfinished tomb of the Valley of the King. Today, the world marvels at them. Untouchable star, know too that the Nile which made Egypt cannot unmake Egypt. I saw conquerors reflect before me and bow their heads. I saw Alexander the Great, handsome as a barbarian, thoughtful as a prophet. Here, yeah, somewhere in this earth, he rests, awaiting resurrection. I saw Caesar one evening. He feared the sun. Our last queen, Cleopatra, bore him a child. But Caesarian was not a true pharaoh and died before ascending the throne. I saw Napoleon and his burning eye. Centuries passed over my forehead. Yet those great soldiers raised no more than dust. I have known years of despair. An irascible emir of the Middle Ages disliked my smile, thought it pagan and ironical, and so had me disfigured by his artillery. Then children found me ugly. No longer did anyone come and pray at my feet or listen to me. The keys of old Egypt were lost. I was nearly buried in sand. All our knowledge, our very soul, rolled in thousands of papyri, was sleeping unknown and unintelligible in dark and silent tombs. Yet the miracle did happen. It was in 1799, near Rosetta. One of Napoleon's officers discovered a stone, a monolith, bearing an edict issued by Ptolemy. The inscription was in Greek characters and hieroglyphs. This was the cornerstone of Egyptology. True, it still remains with interpreted method. First came an Englishman, then a Frenchman, and then an Egyptian. Shampoo, the true father of Egyptian knowledge. He was so inspired as to decipher the lost tongue of ancient Egypt from a few mysterious pirates. Then it was like a resurrection. <laughs> It is 
is as if in answer to a celestial call of trumpets. deep silence, the papyri rustled with a hundred voices. They had bloomed on the bank of the Nile. They had crossed through time. And then, five thousand years later, they unfolded the dramatic story of a civilization. From their leaves even rises the voice of the first schoolboys who struggled to write. They were weary and feared the cane. Master, because you beat me, I have learnt my lesson. Child, no matter how great and deep our knowledge, offer your constant thanks to God, he will grant you his grace always. And learned men from the whole world in quest of this civilization, stronger than sand and death, were enthralled when in maxims and proverbs they found a wisdom as ancient as the pyramids, as eternally young, in the depths of the tombs, they heard voices rising again after thousands of years. The plans of men never wholly succeed, but only what God has ordained. If you want to keep the friendship of people you visit as master, brother, or friend, beware of women. The room where they sit is full of ill feelings. Do not answer good by evil. Justice comes before strength. And historians were deeply moved because so many centuries later they were reading, yes, love letters. What can be sweeter than walking in the fields before a man one loves? I can no longer touch your heart. Why? If I go walking, you are there with me, everywhere, with every step. My hand is in your hand. Listening to your voice troubles my mind. My whole life hangs on your lips. For me, seeing you is better than eating walking. their first echo had already reached you through Greece and Rome, Christianity and Islam. all our strength. The Nile be praised. From its banks came one of the seven wonders of the world. The Nile be praised, for it bears tomorrow's prosperity and happiness. The Nile 
The Nile, which is not a grave, but a cradle. In the course of time, only human achievements crumble and fall. But the spirit which conceived these monuments cannot Thank you.